Good evening, good evening, and welcome to another exciting session of the Virtual Alumni Speaker Series brought to you by the Bahamas Technical and Vocational Institute. My name is Alicia Thompson, and I serve as the Associate Vice President of Fund Development, as well as the advisor for the Alumni Association. Before we begin, I wish to draw your attention to the following. The chat function has been enabled, and that will allow you to communicate with each other, to put your comments in the chat box, and of course, to drop all of your questions for our speaker this evening. Please also feel free to reach out to us at alumni at btbi.edu.bs or to call us at 5026321 or 3. And finally, if your cameras are on, we can see you. And so we suggest that you sit with your backs against a wall, but also be very conscious of your surroundings. Now I invite you to look around in the room and if there's someone whom you know should be in here and they're not in here as yet, please share the link. We have an exciting session for you this evening. Without any further ado, I now welcome Chantel Adderley with the formal welcome. Thank you, Mrs. Thompson. A pleasant good evening to all of you. I am Chantel Adderley, an alumna in the BTVI Association Grand Bahama Chapter. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the third presentation in our 2022 Monthly Distinguished Alumni Speaker Series. I begin by welcoming our very own 2017 alumnus and featured speaker, Mr. Justin Johnson, who continues to make us proud at the air wing of the Royal Bahamas Defense Force. Mr. Johnson, we look forward to hearing from you this evening. I also wish to recognize and welcome each of you, management, faculty, staff, alumni, and friends of BTBI who have signed on this evening in anticipation of another exciting session. I invite you to sit back, relax, Drop your questions or comments in the chat and email us also at alumni at btvi.edu.bs, which are ideas on how we can make these sessions even more better. Once again, you are truly, truly welcome. Well, thank you very much. I don't know about the rest of you, but if you didn't feel welcome before then, Thank you so much, Chantel. Job well done. So now you know we don't waste much time because we, we are here to hear from the speaker. And so what we are going to do now do, I now invite Miss Sonia Gator, who will introduce our speaker for this evening. Good evening. My name is Sonia Gator, and I'm the Chair of Hospitality for the Grand Bahama Chapter of the Alumni Association. It gives me great pleasure to, inter to introduce the featured speaker for this evening. In the words of Eddie Rickenbacker, and I quote, aviation is proof that given the will, we have the capacity to achieve the impossible. Justin Johnson was born on June the 25th 1997 to Brandon Johnson and Philippa Cooper, and has since been blessed with bonus parents, Colin Cooper and Roseanne Johnson. He is the second oldest of six siblings. Justin attended Dandy Lion Preschool and Jordan Prince William Baptist School, where he received the best all round male student award and graduated with honors having obtained seven BJCs and seven BGCSEs. Throughout his childhood, he was determined and focused in all his endeavors. Justin always set life goals, and no matter how things look in the natural world, he would use his mental strength and strive for excellence. Justin enrolled in the Bahamas Technical and Vocational Institute, 
electrical installation certificate program because he was in search of more development and graduated in 2017. Despite life's challenges, Justin maintained his fascinations with planes, which he had since been a little boy. As a child, he would run outside and look up into the sky every time he heard a plane flying overhead. The recently promoted able seaman Justin Johnson enlisted in the Royal Bahamas Defense Force as part of the new entry 54, Women 23, and has served for the past five years. Upon successful completion of his training, he proceeded into the lifelong dream of aviation. And in November of 2019, obtained his private pilot certification from Epic Flight Academy in New Smyrna Beach, Florida. In October of 2021, he received his instrument rating from Superior Academy Gateway in Tampa, Florida. Justin is determined and looking forward to obtaining his commercial pilot certification and hold fast to Ecclesiastes 9-11, which states, I have seen something under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong. Nor does food come to the wise or well to the brilliant or favor to the learned. But time and chance happen to them all. Please join me as I welcome Mr. Justin Johnson to tell of his journey. Good night all. You guys can hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Good night all. First of all, I'd like to thank, thank BTVI for giving me this opportunity. I'd like to thank everybody that's a part of this group opportunity for me. And at the end of the day, I just want to be able to make my family and friends proud. And everybody who knows me know that I'm that type of person. Well, through my journey, I've been through a lot through the years. I've started at Jordan Prince William Baptist School. I went there from grade two straight up to grade 12. And through that time, I learned a lot about being able to stick through the hard times. Perfect example was from grade 10 to 12, I did physics and I failed physics straight up to my, 12, to my grade 12 year. But I was determined that I wanted to do physics. Physics was something that was always something, physics is always a part of anything that I wanted to do because I know I like to work with my hands and I like to be in a technical field. So I stuck with it. I did the BGCSE as well. I got a D, but at the end of the day, I didn't let that stop me from pursuing dreams in the, in the technical field and which includes physics. So after, after that journey, I, I just continued to stick with it. I graduated out of school, got the Brass All Around Meal Award, along with uh, seven BGCSEs and seven BJCS. And at the end of all of that, I realized that I was in the real world. So things started to become a bit shaky in aspect of, I knew I wanted to go to flight school, but I just didn't know the pathway to get there. So I had to sit down and I had to like create a strategy. But within that time, I also knew that I didn't want it to go to the University of the Bahamas because I felt as though I would have hindered myself or put myself inside a bond that I really wasn't interested fully in. So because of that, I shy away from the from, uh, University of Bahamas. Although my mommy wanted me to go, but I, I honestly didn't want it to go. So I, I in turn search and look for a job. Within that, I searched for a job, I found a job at a local shipping company, and I, I was a warehouseman, basically collecting the cargo, uh, scanning the tags, make sure that everything was accounted for inside the warehouse, and actually pulling the packages for the customers at the time. During that journey, 
it was a bit challenging. After a while, I started to realize that I was called for more. After a while, I things became a routine. So because of that, I was like, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. And I said it jokingly, but at the same time, what you say actually do come come life. So I said it in that in that sense, and opportunities just came. I that's when I reached a place where I say I want I want more for my life. I want better. So curiosity, I just I I went to PTBI, I applied, uh, and at the time, the applications officer when I submitted the application and she looked at looked over my paper and realized my qualification, she basically told me that I could apply for financial aid based on your qualifications. And I, I sit down, I think about it, I was like, yeah, maybe I should, because I don't have no money. I don't know how I, I get paid for these classes. And at the time, the local shipping company was in, giving me that much so that I could afford school and still live. So I sit down, I was like, yeah, I think, I think that's the plan. I filled it out right in the front of her and she submitted it. And I just was in hopes that BDBI called me, sitting down, still working at the local shipping company. But during that time, things became more uncomfortable. I started to get, I guess, like they say, when you realize a change about to come, you start to feel uncomfortable inside the stage you're in. So I started still, I still was searching and searching, trying to find ways to make money because I know I want to go to school. Even if BTV, I don't go on me, I still trying to find ways. So I started to buy stuff and sell stuff over, see if I could make a profit from that. I made a, some profit, but in the end, I still, I still didn't want it to be at the local shipping company. So the time came and it was, it was a, Almost like a weird day, and I, I kind of, kind of felt as though something bad was gonna happen. And one of the HR managers called me inside our, our office, called me in for a meeting. At the time, I did already told the told the uh, HR managers, all the supervisors that I was interested in going to BTBI, and they basically looked at it and brushed it off for saying. Never got no answer back to even give me some sort of guideline to say, like, okay, yeah, you might get go to BDBI, but we need the, this these requirements out of you. So, so in that aspect, I was kind of unsure. So I was like, uh, they didn't answer me back. There's been months prior to. And BDBI, they, they finally called me. I got the call from BDBI. It was like, I'm calling just to inform me that you receive a uh, full scholarship from the DBI. And at the time, I was like, wow, it was overwhelming. I sat down and I was like, wow, this is exactly what I actually wanted. I said that I don't want to be at the shipping company. And I started to feel uneasy and I know I didn't want to live for the rest of my life. And then during the meeting, the meeting was kind of heated based on the fact that I stood my ground in a, in a sense that I knew that I give these guys submissions after submissions with emails, uh, paperwork, talk to the supervisors, everything. They knew I wanted to go to BDBI. So they gave me a hard time and I had to sit down. I had to make the decision to just let it go. So at that time, I let it go back, back to square one, basically, not making no more money. The little bit that I had, I was like, I got to make this work because it was kind of rough at the time. Did not know car, but I know I was going to be DBI. What to call, when I went to school, I, I came in, I think it was about maybe a week late in the semester I entered inside the January semester. And when I came in, I went in class and it, it was a different feel because BDBI gave you this feeling like, you're not really in school, but you're actually in school. So everybody was like socializing and it was kind of weird because normally this isn't an I used to. Kind of weird, everybody was getting their work done. And my instructor at the time, Mr. Curry, he, and he handed over the sheet 
And I looked at it and I was like, what? So I was like, oh, wow, this is what electrical about. So I started to like second guess it for say, because I didn't know that these, it was a diagram with a lot of boxes and stuff like that. And like, almost like you have to build the holes in for the wires. And I was puzzled by it. And at the time I was like, oh, I, I didn't know electrical insulation and there's all of this. I just thought you just pull the wires and you go with that. You just make light, that's, that's what you do. <laughs> so at the time I had to sit back, I had to learn how to wire diagrams. So I had to draw the diagrams on the paper and then I had to give it over to my instructor for him to look at it. And then he told me build a, build a diagram. So it, it was kind of challenging in the beginning because I never understand how the wires connect up together, the difference between the colors and stuff like that. So it was a learning experience, but I was learning through the process. It wasn't like I had some guidance through it. I learned through the process. And despite the challenges, sometimes when the school kind of late, sometimes leaving school kind of late, my first semester was very good. I did 16 credits in my first semester, I overloaded. I finished with a 4.0 GPA my first semester. And I, I was like, wow, I could do this. And because I, I started with BTBI and I did it and I saw that I could make a four point. I've, I haven't made a four point since maybe grade two. I was like, whoa, coming from BT, coming from uh, failing all my physics classes and electrical insulation is about physics. And I was like, Man. Physics maybe, they maybe was trying to swing me or something like that in the aspect of it teaching me these stuff. And at the same time, I come to BTVI and I do the same stuff, but I get in some good grades. So I started up. I was like, wow. So I was surprised at myself the first semester. I immediately, after I finished the first semester, I immediately gone into the summer, summer semester. I overloaded as well. And unfortunately, uh, some some something had happened and I was able to get an electrical too. If people who know about electrical insulation and know about BTVI, you don't do all two of your main uh, subjects, main majors in a semester back to back. So I actually did not meet the requirements, the prerequisites to do electrical too. But for some reason, I ended up inside electrical, electrical too and it was hard, but I got through many nights. I was like, boy, I don't know. But I sit down, learn the work, learn the box, uh, got my tools. I realized that things became advanced. I started to hook up water heaters, uh, water pumps, uh, ceiling fans. So it started to become more come together. And be like, oh, that's what they're talking about now. Because the first, the first semester is like, eh, I can do this. I just hooking up one light and a switch. And then after a while, it became more come together. And I say, wow, I realized the big difference. And I realized why they say you don't do a two, a two of the majors back to back. So I sit down and it was kind of, it's kind of baffling, but I had to figure it out quick. Sit down. When I overloaded my summer classes as well, I, I think I did a 14 in my summer classes because I, I was determined that I need to finish before something else, something else kick up. At the time, I'd already applied in Royal Obama's Defense Force from, I think my grade 12, yeah. So I was like, I don't know if they would call me, but at the same time, I just need to be prepared. So I say, I get a push, try push through this electrical insulation because I don't want to stay here too long. And then during that time, I actually started to develop a love for electrical insulation. And I applied the BPL to the process because I already was in the process of doing electrical too, which is the last stage of the electrical classes. Everything else is just trade estimate, blueprint reading. So that's almost like you, you actually reach the finish line. And I was like, okay, I, I get apply the BPL and see how, how that go. And it actually opened up my eyes because I learned to adapt really fast at BTVI. I was able to create a plan, try to stick with it as best as I could. And it was, it was humbling, it was a humbling experience. 
gave me confidence because coming from feeling physics, I was like, I guarantee into another physics class. So I don't know what to expect, but I just need to finish this one. So I, I went and I continue to push, continue to push. And then things changed. Summer semester, I finished summer semester. My birthday was in June. July, I got a call. I got a call and I was like, wow. Got a call from the Robert Hamas Defense Force. Called me, they told me that. I've been selected in the new entry, 54, women entry 23. And I have to sign some documents and paperwork. At the time, I was like, I still do a BTVI and still wasn't sure. And I was like, okay. But I took, I, I basically take a, I sit down, reevaluate it. I was like, at the same time, money still have to make. I have to make some money to get where I want to get. So I have to make some sort of sacrifice. But through the process, I remember the state class. There was a thirst, it was a Thursday. Thursday day, I was in a barbershop getting prepared because Saturday was the training day. Thursday, I got a call from Central Bank. Central Bank called me. He said, Mr. Johnson, just called me to let you know that you have been awarded one of our scholarships and scholarships. At the time, I applied when I graduated at Central Bank. I didn't even remember. But when they called me, I said, oh, yeah, I did apply. And they said, uh, you have been awarded one of our scholarships in aviation. So I sit down and I said, Ooh. decisions again. So everything came, up, came at me at once. And I had to sit back. It, it was really overwhelming. It was confusing. Me being young, I was, at, I was 19 at the time. I was like... I don't know what to do. I continue to seek God for guidance, continue to push through. And I made the decision. I, I heard the phone call, but at the same time, I was trying to find out more, but they didn't allow me to find out anymore because they wanted me to come to this meeting. They had this big chair meeting where they wanted me to come and uh, sit down with them so they could go over all the formalities and stuff of the contract. But I, I never went to that meeting, so I never knew what they was offering. But that Saturday, I went into training, I took it, and I sat down, and that was June, July 9th. Before independence, I went into training. Sit down, and I was like, boy, I really doing this. Hit my head, ball, and everything for the first time. It was, get, it was like, mm -hmm. But I went through it. My first night was horrible. <laughs> Went through the torture of the Obama Defense Force training, sit down, was contemplating kind of like, is this really for me? But at the same time, I always knew that my mental strength was my strength. Physically, I used to, I, I feel, I felt the burden, I felt the, the stress, the hardship and everything. But mentally, I always looked beyond that. So I, I sit down, I was break up that night. <laughs> you didn't go sleep that night. <laughs> so it, it was a different experience for me. Waking up by the sound of a bell was a normal. So it, it was kind of crazy. Everything was in turmoil. You sleep in, in uniform, basically, <laughs> because when the bell rings, you get a jump up and go outside. So it, I sit down that night and I was like, well, this is really for me. But then, then it pushed through. I always remember everything was a mental thing. Physically, your body will get tired on the Royal Bahamas Defense Force during the Royal Bahamas Defense Force training. But mentally, that's where they build the mental aspect of, of your body. Because you learn that mentally, if you say that you can do it, the body actually follows suit. And that's where I realized that the mind is a serious thing. I learned a lot of adaptability, I sit down, learned a lot of discipline. It was weird in the beginning, but gave me a lot of responsibility, a lot of confidence. And through it all, I was grateful for the opportunity, thankful for the opportunity. And the day finally came when I, I passed out of training. Instead of being 16 weeks, I did 20 weeks in training because hurricane, the hurricane came. 
So we got sent home, sent us home. But with them sending us home was the unfortunate uh, conversation, come at the unfortunate meeting we had where we learned that we had to stay an additional four, four more weeks. <laughs> so we was like, wow, shoot. So when we was thinking we was gonna pass it, we didn't pass. Found ourselves going to Andres in training, helping the guys basically pick up their hopes. We was like, wow. In Andres and 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 it was it was crazy. We got wet and dry on that on the Royal Bahamas Defense Force School. And we went down, keep pushing. We left a lot of trees. <laughs> I think they even got a picture out for me on the Royal Bahamas Defense Force website with me lifting the trees at that time. And it, it was kind of rough seeing the guys them just sit down. They sitting out in their front room, but no walls. You literally see into the whole oaks, but they sitting down there like they trying to figure out where, where to turn. And it was, it was Finally, passed. So went in the BMT department for about two weeks after they find out I did electrical insulation. So they're just like, yo, you do electrical insulation. So that means you know a little something. So sent me to be uh, the BMT department, that's the base maintenance team. So I did a little bit of work there, learned a little bit of, about electrical inside the field rather than just working on the on the board where we are. And it was a good experience. Spent two weeks here, got sent in the military police department. After which, spent about uh, three years there in military police department. And at that time, first year, the military police department, I started to get complacent, started to spend money stupidly, bought my first car. I just was having fun at that time. So I was like, man, okay, that's a good job. I could see it. it I, I could see me making some money. I went from making little bit of money to make in a lot of money then. So I was like, oh yeah, this is kind of good. But then I sit down, refocus myself, sit down, went through a lot uh, fighting with myself because when I wanted to spend money, I, I had to say, no, I can't spend money. Went back in the ground school because I have, I previously enrolled in the ground school when I was in school, in high school. But I was in, I didn't complete it based on uh, requirements that the FAA needed, the Federal Aviation Association needed. I wasn't able to complete it to be able to take my written examination. So I just, I basically just left it alone. So I didn't even look back until I was about maybe 20. That's when I started to look back at it and be like, yeah, I need to go back into the ground. So I picked up my world box, went through the Went through the ground school. Sometimes when I had to work on my downtime, I try to study as much as I could. And the guy, someone was looking at me and trying to figure out like, what I doing? Like, this, this isn't normal for people, um, especially in the military, the police department, because we constantly be up on our feet because we do sentry duties all the time. So it isn't much time for you to sit down. You don't have much breaks in the military police department. And then you work in six shifts. On top of that, so because of that, you basically just here you working, but at the same time, it wasn't like no more room to really get around, uh, to get some sort of progress going in the sense of studying and stuff like that. But I always, I always stick with it. When I had a downtime, I, I went to my ground school. I do what I gotta do. Talk to some more guys about aviation. But aviation isn't really a big topic to talk about. A lot of guys really don't say that much, but they, they say the good times. They don't really say the bad times. Aviation is very expensive. I, I sit down and I went to the ground school. I found a guy over here, classes with him. But at the same time, I was still scared because I didn't want it to be as, I can't make the requirements for me to actually take my written tests. So I went to the States, I say, this time I, I could be sure that I could be able to take the steps. I went to the States and did the ground school there, got the sign off from American Flyers, went there, uh, did the ground school, got the sign off. And it was a weekend ground school based on the fact that I already did some studying and I already went to the ground school before. 
And that Sunday, that Sunday I was contemplating if I really take the steps because I, when I was doing the examination, I wasn't making the grades that I wanted. So I sit down and I was like, but if I go back home, I don't know when I can come back. So I had, to, I had to take the leap of faith, sit down, pray about it. And I took the leap of faith, took the examination, I passed it, fortunately, passed it. <laughs> Barely passed, but at the end of the day, it's a pass. And that's what the guy told me to see. Because I, I was kind of disappointed in myself. I passed it with a 77, and the passing mark was a 70%. And he's like, man, don't worry about it, you pass. Once you pass, you're good. You don't have to take this no more. Don't worry about the grade being a 77 at the end of the day. That's a pass because at the same time, they still look up. If you take it again, they have something that would say, take two. So that means you take it twice. So they'll think, well, they'll ask you, how come you took that down twice? You feel it the first time? Like they're trying to figure out why. So I was like, yeah, I could just leave it. Came back home. And it, when I came back home, I was like, okay, I got one step finished. Now it's time for me to move on to the practical part. Well, I actually have to fly this plane on. And I was like, Okay, this where the, the, the real, like this where everything come together. I need about $20,000. Came home, I was like, okay, I get that stage finish. I only had two years, because once you take that exam, you have two years to finish. Need about $20,000. At that time, I contemplated, I say, yeah, all right, just so I get, just so I get back on this. I have to finish my electrical insulation. I said, I have to go back there. I have to go back to the training. So I started, I started to work along with uh, the guy who actually did the electrical wiring for my parents' home. Started to work along with him, got in contact with him, work along with him. He showed me a few things. And I was fortunately able to go back to BDBI, finish off. I only had about three classes at the time. It was two classes and then the internship. And I I breathed through the two classes because when I couldn't make it, I tell my instructor I can't make it, but anything that you need me to do, send me the information. Once I off, I'll come in, even if I need to, even if it isn't class time, if you die, I can come in and we could do something to make sure that I could get this uh, job job accomplished. I got it finished and he, he's lenient with me, understand that I was a working guy, trying to push, trying to be positive, young at it. So he, he liked the drive that I had. So he sat down, he sent me all the information. When I couldn't make classes, he sent me the information and I was able to complete it. And I sent it back to him. He was like, yeah, okay, good stuff. You want, you want the ball? Although you're in here, you're good. I was like, okay, that's a good sign. Continued, I continued to do that for the two, two of my classes. I, I enrolled the two classes and did it. And when the interim said, it's like, gee, this is the time where I actually need some time off because I had to do about a hundred and something hours. And I say, I only had about, I think it was about two months to complete or something like that. But God stepped in and God did what he, what he always do. I was able to, I, I finished maybe within three to four months. I, I, I went over the time, but at the time, I, I was in constant talk with the people who was dealing with the internship, telling them that I doing I doing my internship is just that I need some time. Uh, I can uh, currently working, and I still trying to do this on my off time in my downtime. And sometimes with the defense force, you get called in work even when you're off. So I was just taking a leap of faith, being determined in what I do, and just was pushing. And I was able to finish it within about four months. That's why I received my lowest grade in BGBI. <laughs> I, always, I always remember that day. Got to see inside my, my internship because I took long, I took long to complete the internship. And I understand why, kind of disappointed because I, I was doing pretty well. Still was able to finish with about, a, I think it was a 3.7 GPA. And I paid for the graduation package, but I never, I never actually walked at BDVI. I received the certificate, received the transcript, received everything, but I didn't walk. But I, I, just, I did that to say that at the end of the day, you have to finish what you started. And that's all I remember, finish what I started. And with me finishing what I started, 
I worked along with the guy, continue working along with the guy. And eventually he said, you're doing a good job now. You're doing a good work. I could keep I could keep you around now. I could actually pay you now. Started off with about seven dollars an hour. I said, wow, this this would have done this. So I, I that was the drive to keep me going. So I, I sit down, I was going to work, knocking off. If I did a 12 day shift, knock off eight that morning, switch my clothes by 9 30, 10 o'clock. I was on the construction site. Working, working till about three o'clock, then come home sometimes, or sometimes I had to go right back to four o'clock. Go back home, go home, catch a shower, go right back to work. Knock off 12 midnight a day. Sometimes my parents didn't even see me for whole day because I, I was constantly trying to push my results. And I was able to accumulate the funds with the help of uh, other scholarship grant that I took, that I applied for when I was inside school as well, with the help of my, my mommy. She, she had me applying for all that was stuff. So at the time, I, I just was applying, but I didn't really understand the, the importance of it fully. But I knew that it was a sort of formality. So I sat down and I went through it. And I, found, I actually found out that I got a $7,500 grant from the, uh, from the Bahamas government. It was a grant when I graduated. And, Immediately, I signed up to the school, so that was seven thousand five hundred. Needed about thirteen thousand more. So at that time, I just pushing and pushing and pushing. I was able to accumulate about thirteen thousand in a year, and I, I sat down and I was like, "Wow!" I, I amazed myself when I realized that I literally had thirteen thousand dollars, and I actually do it like. I, I felt good about it, although I was tired, but mentally I knew that's what I needed to do. I, I sent the money off to the school right away, sent it, and the school was waiting on me anxiously. But at the same time, I, I needed some time off from the Obama's event force. I had to put in my applications, put in the request forms, go through the formalities, read on responses. Sometimes they take a while, sometimes they don't. But at the end of the day, I sit down and I was waiting. I, with me waiting, I just was constantly studying because I knew that I doing the flight portion now, trying to learn what I will expect when I go because I never flew on a small plane, never did a discovery flight. So I didn't even know what it was, what type of plane I even flying in. All I know is I go into flight school. Whenever the time comes and they allow me to go, I go into flight school. I, I stick to that and I hold on to that. And the time came, I got, I was able to go to flight school approximately three months when the flight school. And during that time, flight school, I realized that aviation is expensive. I didn't know that. So I was like, oh, now I realize what they're talking about. The minute you start the engine, you pay in money, even if you take off as it. So I had to sit down and realize I was paying about 200 and some dollars an hour. I needed about approximately 40 hours to actually finish my private. So when I did the calculations, that was well over $20,000. This don't make no sense. Comes the final, aviation schools only quote you on minimums, which in most times you would not finish on minimum requirements. So I had to sit down and I was like, oh, that's not what I, I didn't expect that. Unfortunately, I, I was able to I able to get through with the help of my parents and everybody else around me. I was able to get a little bit more funds, and I was still getting paid from the Obama Supreme Court at the time as well. So I got more than twenty thousand dollars and finished with about twenty six thousand dollars, which was kind of crazy. I sat down for quite a while, and when I came back home. It, it, it was kind of different and kind of weird based on the fact that prior to, I had to deal with uh, my stepfather's, my stepfather going away for a few months because he had a, found out he had a brain uh, tumor that had to be removed. So I was, I was basically the man of hopes for a few months prior to going to flight school. And I had to learn responsibility. I basically sold everything I had. 
sold my car, I sell everything because I say I go into flight school. But I I wasn't expecting that my stepdaddy would have fallen ill, ill all the time. So I had to basically beat him on. Uh, make sure my siblings get to school on time, make sure I get to work. At the time you had to rent a car because I didn't have no more car. I had to rent a car from the rental car company, paying them by the month, it was crazy, but I, I had to do it. And it, it teach me responsibility, teach me how to be a man, teach me that you have to be prepared for to prepare to have a child, not really just have a child for having a child safe. And I I learned a lot of responsibility then. And it I didn't see my parents when I went over to flight school. I went over by, by myself and I just made it up and I learned the process, went through everything by myself, went to the visa embassy by myself because my mommy was in here. That daddy was in here. So I just, the little bit of information I had, I went with that and I, I did it. And after everything, I sat down and I was like, wow, one stage finish. I was like, I never thought that I, I would see it. I became a pilot, became a private pilot, and it was overwhelming because the, at the time, my flight instructor told me straight up, he said, uh, first of all, I don't want you to think that aviation only for the rich. And that stuck with me because I was like, based on how the ends it only looked like it's for the rich people because I didn't get this type of money to be spending. BTPI gave me a full scholarship. So because of that, I was like, I really, I really know what it is to really spend this type of money. And BTPI's tuition is way less than that. I, I could get a couple of degrees with this. I could go back to BTPI and get a couple of degrees. $20,000 ain't a little bit of money. So I was like, yeah. But at the same time, what I learned as well, he told me, he was talking to me and I didn't know at the time, but he had military background. He was a Marine cop at the time. So he understand the discipline and the things that come along with being in, in the military. So I was telling him the urgency of me getting back home. And at the time, Dorian happened, I was I was actually in the States when Dorian in the States on the Daytona Beach, <laughs> right on the on the on the east on the east coast. And at the time the hurricane was coming out our direction. And I don't want me, I say, I have to stay because I don't know how I get back home. So she was still in the States in Miami at the time as well, with my stepfather. So I said I could ride out the storm over here. So I could, I could go through that. So that was that was the eye-opening opportunity, <laughs> eye-opening opportunity. And I I realized that I could actually defend on my own, like my parents trained me well, and I could actually do this thing. So I get, I had more confidence within myself. I continued to bust through, came back home, uh, keep working, keep pushing at it, keep selling my stuff. Selling, buying and selling, trying to make awesome, do more electrical stuff, learn more in the field. And I, I ended up finding another electrician to work with. And I was doing volunteer work with this guy, but this guy had a three phase electrical uh, license. And I say, that's what I want. So because I, I wanted that, I started to work with him. He was doing a house in the area where I lived. And I sit down there. One day when I came home, I sit down in the car and I was like, maybe I should go see who doing the electrical work for this, this, this hose. So I actually sit down and I went down and I met the guy and he talked to me and I helped him out. And he, it was only him one. So it, was, it, it came across like he needed some help. So I said, okay, yeah, that's a good opportunity. When he had one, I could get some personal mentorship, mentorship from him. And me and him started to talk more and more. And then I realized this guy was a police officer and I was a defense force officer. So because our scheduling, totally different and our scheduling is basically on the same pace in the aspect of when we off, we really ain't off all the time. So he was able to work with me and me and him was able to do small jobs, maybe like our two jobs in the beginning. And then it started to become bigger jobs. And then he realized that, yeah, man, I could keep this guy around. And he he offered me a job. He said, man, I can start paying you. And he said, okay. I said, okay, cool. 
So at the time I said, okay, I get this one to pay me too. So I sit down, I say, okay, I could work with two electricians now. I, I started work with two electricians with, with the little bit of time I had, continue to push, continue to push. And I, it was unbelievable. Everything just started to unfold. At the time, I was like, I actually won this. And I never thought a little boy like me who, who always used to watch planes in the sky would be there flying a plane and like having fun. Like it, it was cool. And at the same time, I knew that I needed more money. So I had to sit back down. I say, more money got to come. I have to do my instrument now. So I, I got a lot of quotes. Fortunately, I didn't want to go back to that school based on the fact that it was expensive. I didn't have the, I didn't have the funds to, to, to finish with that school. I had, the, had a look around, found a school. Fortunately, same concept, legal fake. Was able to talk to the owner and he sat down and he basically break down the whole instrument during the me. And from then, I, I didn't like that, that experience and I didn't even meet him as yet. When I actually went to the school, Superior Aviation, went to the school, I met him first time. Comes to find out this guy was a Caribbean guy. So he, he kind of understand the Caribbean background in the aspect of our tradition and the way we live and stuff like that. It isn't like how the Americans live. So he understand the struggle and the, the, the hardship you go through to try to get where you need to get. So he sat down, I was able to talk to him, I said, I need to be finished in a month. I say, I only have a month to be over here. I, I need to be finished. He's just like, yeah, okay, I get, I can try to make sure I get you through, but you need to do about 20 hours uh, uh, cross country PIC time. That's basically time whereas I fly by myself. And I had to fly by myself, build them hours. And then when I went there, I say, okay, I got the 20 hours now, I'm ready to go. Gave me the instructor the first week we did all 15 and hours what I was required to do. And I was like, this happened fast. So the money, I watched the money drop fast. <laughs> so I said, like, yeesh. So I started to scratch my head. But at the same time, my instructor, my instructor was a was a pretty cool guy. Me and him started to talk. And then he found out that I was 24 and he was 24. He's like, man. Well, we didn't see him age. So he started to feel a little bit more, I guess, comfortable because he thought I was older than him. <laughs> so he, he felt comfortable and me and him started to talk more and he started to tell me about his background because he was from Ethiopia. In aviation, you get to meet a lot of people from different backgrounds, and different diversities and different cultures. So I was able to like basically enjoy the moment, went through the formalities, went through uh flight training was able to successfully complete although <laughs> it was rough in the ending part when it was coming down to finishing i started to do a little bit of rocky stuff but he didn't like and he was like man we gotta brush up on these hands and at the same time i was like i ain't got no money <laughs> so <laughs> he was like but we we need about one more flight i say i say i can't do one more flight i only have money for check right i say tell me everything i need to do I can try to remember them when I go to Jack Rack. So he, he said, okay. So he tell me everything I needed to do. I went into school early for him for us to go over the oral portion of it. And fortunately, I was able to pass. I went to the Jack Rack, the designated pilot examiner. That's, per, that's the person who actually uh, examines you and give you the certificate. He said that you successfully pass or you fail. She was pleased in my performance able to answer most of the questions she gave me. And this is quite cool. Came back home, I earned my instrument. So I got to feel more like a real pilot because when you're be private, pilots that I forget, you only could fly at a certain altitude and you got to make sure I look at the floor because you watch, you look at our teams on the floor to guide you along the way. Whereas with instrument, you're relying on your instrument. So you're looking more inside the plane, you could be able to fly in the clouds, with no issue, you could fly in a little bit of adverse weather. And it was a different feeling because you get to actually learn what these instruments are all about. And it's amazing the instruments inside the plane actually could get you straight, straight to the one, straight to the runway 
without you even looking outside. And that was kind of cool to me, my first time doing it. He told me, all right, take off the forwards because I, I got on some uh, view limiting devices. So they blurry. I couldn't see outside. I only get to see the instruments in the cockpit. And he say, go visual. When he say go visual, I take off the, the glasses. When I look, run right in the front of me. Everything I did, that's how I know I did it well. And I completed the task. All I had to do was man the aircraft. And then I did an instrument approach. So I was like, oh, that's what the instrument approach is. And the more and more I did it, the more and more I was amazed by the accuracy inside these, these instruments and approach plates that we was using. And I was like, wow, this, the people who sit down and study this thing really, really did a good job because I would have never known that this would aviation all about because like I say, the guidance along the way isn't, uh, isn't we, we want to get a little bit of knowledge about aviation. We don't get much. So it was, it was a worded experience. If I had to do it, do it again, sit back down, do it again and reevaluate myself. Right now, I go into the process of doing it again because <laughs> currently I sell everything. <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, that's what you have to do. You have to make the sacrifices and you got to keep on pushing. I have a question for you, Justin. This is this is quite interesting. Tell me, you spoke about getting up, um, joining, in, in, enlisting in the BDF and getting up at night in uniforms, etc. cetera. Um, how did your BTVI journey, the training that you received at BTVI, how did that assist you uh, when you enlisted in the BDF? When I, when I enlisted, I, because I was always a person of mental fortitude, I was always the oldest, the oldest sibling. Because of that, it was more an enhancement to what the, the things I already knew. So BTVI gave me that extra push to say that. I actually could make it in the real world. And because of that, I was able to propel myself uh, further than what I even expected sometimes. And I was able to get through BTBI. And I was like, from me not knowing that I have to build a hose in for the electrical wiring and stuff like that. And at the same time, me sitting down and actually drawing up these things, I didn't know what I was doing in the beginning. But then I realized it came all together. So it, it basically gave me the growth and uh, the push that I needed from coming from failing physics and stuff like that. It gave me the confidence. Tell me about the challenges. Now you hold, you, there was a litany of challenges. You spoke about failing physics. Oh, you told us yeah. a couple of that. You fail physics, you fail physics, and then you came to BTBI and you came yes. to come back. You spoke about your experience at the shipping company where... They knew that you wanted to further your education, but then when you really took that leap, then yeah. there were all kinds of challenges, right? They caught feelings. You spoke about the illness of your stepfather. Um, tell me, what is your advice to those who are listening about and challenges? Then, How did the challenges help to make you better? And what is your advice to them when they're faced with challenges? What I, would, what I always tell people is that at the end of the day, you have to run your own race. You can't look at somebody else and feel as though they're doing better than you because you don't know the status of them. You don't know what they have to go through and you don't know the background of how they get these things. So you have to run your own race. You have to stick to your plan and go with it because at the end of the day, I always look at the word impossible. The word is not impossible. It's I am possible. So that's, that's how I look at it. So I always remember that and I say, anytime I face with some adverse or some decision, I always sit down, I pray about it, go to God and I sit down and I say, I am possible to make this happen. I'm gonna make this happen. So that's how I look at it. And then I also, mean, oh, sorry. And also the art I, I create, uh, I created this PowerPoint just to show the transition. So I have a few videos that you guys can look at and you can actually see the, pro the process in real life and how it unfolds. Okay. So I get, I get change that now. Okay.
Oh, this the beginning, the beginning slide. That's me as a little child going through the ass. Okay, uh, we're not able to see it. We're not able to see it. You're not able to see? No. Okay, hold on. Your screen share? You can see it now? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, all right. This is a little, it isn't too long. It's just something to, to show the progress behind the story. All right. Uh, this is basically the introduction. And in the introduction, I have motivation is what gets you started. Habits is what keep you going. And that's what it is. I create a habit of mental fortitude, even when I can't see it. I, I create the habit of, I want to be able to be successful. And as a child, I always watch the planes outside, running outside. Once I awake, any time of the night, once I get to open up that door, I was opening up that door and I was going outside to watch the plane. A uh, few pictures when I was a when I was a child, growing up through the years, always outside, never really a TV person, so I find myself to be outside most of the time. Uh, this is actually a video when I was inside PGDI. And it it this was one of my practical exams actually. And it basically explains what I was saying. Okay, it's not, we're not able to hear anything. Okay, hold on. Still not hearing anything. Okay, hold on. Hold on. We try to shut our audio. Okay, perhaps you can just go on to another slide. Yeah, I could just go on to the next slide. But, but most of them, most of them are videos that was basically showing my journey. I really wish I could get the, the audio because the audio basically explains everything within itself. Whereas I don't want to talk about it. Well, I have one other question. I have another question for you. And you yes, spoke about family and I have I have the pleasure of knowing so many members of your family even before I met you I knew of your mother uh, yes, of course I know your father Brandon I know your grandfather um, Charles Johnson who's also on the call and so that's your family right I also know about your defense force family and so I would like yes, to say at this time thank you so much Lieutenant Delron Mitchell whom I saw is on the call <laughs> thank you so much for for allowing us and accommodating us to be able to go and take that photo and please um, express our thanks to Commodore Dr. Raymond King for also you know expediting that and I saw a note earlier from Bravo Watch at Air Wing so you know you have family around you not only family, family, blood family, but you have that other family now that's embraced you. What is the importance of family through all of this? So give us, let us know what is, what's the role of family? What's the importance of family uh, for students at UPDI? Okay. I look at family as basically about one. Family is everything that you have. At the end of the day, you could uh, lose everything, but you only have family. So behind the uh, successes, my family was still there along the way. And even still, I do all of this because of my family. My family gave me and paved the way, encouraged me, even when I, I 
it's almost like when I was lost, I wasn't sure what to do. I just was going to the formalities. And growing up as a child, I learned I learned responsibility over early because I had siblings under me. So family is a big role that that's a part of me. I I also family. I do everything that I could do for my family. And everybody know that. Even in the airway department, as much as I could do, I try to do, I try to give knowledge to everybody. So once I once I know the knowledge or once I pick up on something new, I, I try to share the knowledge. And within with saying that, I was able to help out one of my other colleagues with going to flight training. He went to the same flight school, I did my instrument art. And today he actually passed his check rank. And he got his instrument rated as well. Excellent, excellent. And finally, as we bring this your, your comments part to a close, I saw someone drop in the chat, words frame your world. Roseanne, yes. you are so right. Because I do recall Justin coming into my office and from as long as I could remember, he always said, I'm going to be a pilot. I'm going to be a pilot. And I could tell you, no matter how long our conversations were or no matter how short they were, no matter how long it was between the time that I saw him the last time and the time that he come walking into the office, I could always tell you before he left, he would say, I'm going to be a pilot. And so Justin, what is your advice to persons? I mean, like, how were you able to remain so focused? Share that with us. I always, when you have a drive for something, you pursue it. And I learned that from a young age. I always had a drive that I, I want to be a pilot. From child to even going left, per se, to get back right, I always remember aviation was the key goal. So I had to make the, the extra steps in the, the <laughs> to make it off with. Electric, uh, BDVI was not really inside my arena. RBDF was not inside my arena but I had to sit down and analyze it. And I had to actually come to the realization I had to use some logic behind it as well. I can't just go based on, yeah, I want to be a pilot because that didn't get me no well. I got to put some money behind that. I got to put some drive behind that as well. So I had to learn that, yeah, I, I have to make some decisions that I might not want to do, but at the same time, it actually worked out for the best because I kept the positive out of doing and I maintained the positivity through the through everything, through the adversity, through the down times, through the hard times, because my stepdaddy was always, I always knew when things happened because my stepdaddy was the one who always fell ill. When I did my instrument, he had to do a box surgery. So because of that, I always knew that he, he kept me going because I knew he was going through some battling within his, in his body. But at the same time, I knew that I need to be able to finish this so that I could be able to keep him going as well so that he could be proud of me. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And now I invite Ms. Jada Says to take us on home. Good evening, all. My name is Jada Says, and I'm the secretary of the New Providence chapter of the Alumni Association. Abel Seaman Johnson, how inspirational. As I looked for an appropriate way to thank you I came across the pilot's prayer. May the Lord Jesus be always at your side as savior and friend. Beneath you, as you fly at such heights and with danger now. Hold you with angel wings and keep you safe. Be behind you to watch over your back. Be your guide when vulnerable. Be ahead of you, guiding your instincts and decisions above you to reveal heaven's gates. We are so BTVI proud of you. Thank you for sharing and we look forward to greater and better things from you in the future. Now to our alumni updates. <clears throat> there will be no regular scheduled meetings held in April as we have canceled all meetings for the month of April in observance of Holy Week. The Alumni Association New Providence Chapter will pay an Easter visitation to the BTBI preschool on April 13, 2022. 
please contact us if you wish to donate toward the Easter basket drive in preparation for the visit. President Tertiana Miller wishes to thank all of the alumni from the Grand Bahama chapter who attended yesterday's church service. We extend condolences at this time to the family of Bianca Penn. She was one of our office assistant 2019 alumna who passed away last week. Your continued prayers are also requested for 1995 alumnus, Ryan Bethel and family, as they are also still dealing with the disappearance of their father, Mr. Robert Bethel. All BTBI potential graduates, you are reminded that the deadline for application for graduation is April 1st, 2022. Please apply now so that we may welcome you into the Alumni Association. Anyone wishing to join the Alumni Association WhatsApp chat or to purchase alumni branded items, such as mugs, lanyards, tumblers, t-shirts, your arts to contact us at 424 0431 or 502-6321 or three. Those have been the announcements. Now back to you, Mrs. Thompson. You're muted, Mrs. Thompson. Okay, thank you very much. So there I go. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jeddah. Excellent job. I'd like to say thank you once again. Thank you to Mr. Justin Johnson. You know, our lives are all much better now that you've spent the last hour with us. We are grateful for all of you who have joined us. We remind you that we will be back here one more time at the end of next month, the last Monday in the month for the Alumni Speaker Series. And so again, I've dropped in the chat, the contacts, 424-0431, the email address, alumni at btvi.edu.bs, and our office number, 5026321 or 3. We would like to hear from you. So until next month, continue to remain BTVI proud. Good night.